Hey everyone, welcome back to my channel. It's a good day. I hope you're feeling it. So today I am continuing it on with my Sahaba series that I have going here on YouTube. This series is kind of like a mini Islamic history series where I talk about Sahabas that are maybe a little bit less known and share their stories with you guys. So today's story is about Samaya bin Qayyat. So if you're interested in hearing about that, then please keep watching. So this is actually the first female that I'm speaking about in this series. So I'm super, super excited because she's probably one of my favorites to have yet. So Samaya was a poor woman and this story takes place in Mecca. So when the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam first began teaching about Islam, it was in Mecca and then after a time he migrated to Medina. So all the stories that you pretty much hear about Mecca will be from Islam's beginning. So Samaya was a slave. She was a poor woman of Mecca and she didn't have any tribal affiliates. Generally speaking, people in that time had tribes and clans in which they sought protection and refuge from. And if you didn't have a tribe, then you were left vulnerable. Samaya had a husband named Yasir and her son named Ahmad. So all three of them, Samaya, her husband and her son were from amongst the earliest converts to Islam. Soon after the Prophet Sallallahu did receive revelation he began preaching publicly and this resulted in the persecution of the small Muslim community because at this stage the Muslim community was very small and there were only a number of people that had accepted Islam and were following the Prophet furthermore people that did accept Islam often hid their faith from others because they feared being persecuted themselves so in a world of the Quraysh, there were people in which accepted Islam but hid it and then an even smaller amount of people who accepted Islam and publicly declared that they were Muslims. So because they were also not only just accepting Islam but publicly declaring that they are Muslims, these people were targeted even more so. So Samaya was one of those people along with her husband and her son who did publicly declare that they were a Muslim. They were among one of the first people that declared this and because, like I said, she was a slave and she was a lower class citizen within society, she became a target. She didn't have any affiliations with any tribes or any clans as a form of protection for her. So Maya, her husband and her son were all captured tied up and beaten. This was the beginning of the attack on the Muslims from the leaders of Quraysh. And the mastermind behind this attack was called Abu Jahil. So Abu translates to father and Jahil translates to ignorant. So he was labeled as the father of ignorance. They lived in the desert and they would stake the Muslims out at noontime in the sun with the perching sun burning their skin. He would pile stones and rocks on the chest of his victims. And it's said that one of the ways in which Samaya and her family were tortured is that they would be encased in an iron, a really, really hot iron armor and sat in the sun so that the metal from the armor would burn their skin. And this would eventually cause them to be burnt alive. I think that it's really, really important to know that the Prophet ﷺ did know about this and was troubled by this, but he wasn't able to take immediate action. I think this is just a demonstration that the Prophet ﷺ he was not superhuman so although he physically could not do anything at that time he could strengthen them through their faith the Prophet ﷺ would constantly try to comfort them and he would say patience O family of your seed because you are destined for paradise so he is here promising that family paradise and he's telling them have patience for what you're bearing what you're going through because verily you will receive paradise for it and what is better than that Samaya was so strong, she was strong physically in being able to bear all that torture, but she was so strong in her faith as well. Abu Jahid would torture her, but she would defy him by smiling at him. With all the ways in which he tortured her, physically, emotionally, in every way that you can think of, she smiled back at him. So imagine your torturer abusing you physically, abusing your husband, abusing your child, and you still having that strength to smile at him while you're being abused, while you're being tortured, while you're in the scorching hot sun being burnt alive. Another thing that she would do is that she would invoke the name of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So every time that he would tell her to denounce her faith, to say the idols' names in which they worshipped, because at that time they were idol worshippers, and so they would tell her, say this idol's name, say this idol's name, say that this is your God. And she would say that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is her God, and she would always consistently invoke the name of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala 
while being tortured. Abu Jahil was so angered by this that in a fit of rage he eventually killed her. It's narrated that he took a spear and he stabbed it straight through her lower abdomen and she died almost instantly. Right there and then she became the first person in Islam to die as a martyr. To die for the sake of Allah and in the name of Islam. That is so incredible you guys. The first martyr in Islam, the first person to die for the sake of their religion, for the sake of our religion, was a slave. The first person to die for her faith in Islam was a female. The first person to die in saying that I will not renounce the fact that I believe in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala was somebody with no status, no tribal affiliations, no protection from anybody else. Somebody who before Islam was severely oppressed and even while she was a Muslim was severely oppressed but Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala lifted her up through her faith. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave her something to live for and something to die for. It's just the most amazing thing that with all her lack of status, she found empowerment and she found dignity in Islam. A female who had been told all of her life before Islam that she had no voice, that she had no purpose, that she had no place in society, found empowerment through her religion and felt that to be something that was worth living and dying for. The Muslims that came after her took her as an example of somebody who had courage and bravery to do what was right. I also quickly want to touch on Samaya's son. So Samaya's son Ahmad, after having watched his mother be killed and his father be killed and being consistently tortured himself, Ahmad actually couldn't deal with the torture anymore and he actually denounced his religion. He declared that he wasn't a Muslim anymore, that he didn't believe in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was not his prophet. Upon this, Abu Jahil released him and Umar instantly ran to the Prophet ﷺ and told him what he had done. The Prophet ﷺ comforted him. Instead of reprimanding him, the Prophet ﷺ comforted him. Because the Prophet ﷺ knew that even though Umar did speak words and denounce his faith in words, his heart still had Islam in it. He was still a Muslim at heart. He just didn't want to be tortured anymore and he couldn't handle the torture. And actually it said that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala brought down a verse for this occasion specifically. It's said to be revealed in response to Amal's devastation at what he had done. So I'll read that for you quickly. So the verse is, Whoever disbelieves in God after having believed in him, not the one who is compelled to utter a word of disbelief under duress while his heart is at peace with faith, but the one who embraces disbelief wholeheartedly, upon such people is wrath from God and they will suffer a great punishment. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying here that whoever really truly disbelieves after having believed, they will suffer the wrath of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and they will suffer the great punishment. But this is not including those in which have been tortured, have been abused and have been forced to denounce their faith for any specific reason. So the person whose heart is pure, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows if your heart is pure and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will not punish that person. At this time, some new Muslims actually started calling Ahmad a disbeliever. Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa actually defended him and he said no. Indeed, Ahmad is full of faith from head to toe. So he's saying no, he's not from among the disbelievers. Don't say that. Ahmad, he has a pure heart who is full of faith. Soon after this, I want to also mention that the Prophet ﷺ was able to take action and he was able to escort that small group of Muslims who were being abused due to the fact that they didn't have any tribal connections. And he escorted them to Abyssinia who sought protection from a Christian king that was a fair ruler and they were safe under his rule. Ahmad, Samaya's son, went on to be one of the Prophet Muhammad ﷺ's most trusted companions and that is the legacy of Samaya. Isn't her story so amazing, you guys? Honestly, it just is one of my most loved stories. One of the stories that just really make me so, like, teary-eyed and happy. So I hope that you guys enjoyed this story. If you did enjoy this video, then I'm sure that you're going to enjoy my last video about Salman al farsi I'll link that at the end of the video. And if you did enjoy this video, then please give this a thumbs up and subscribe so that I know that you do want more videos like this. With that being said, I love you guys and I'm just going to go now. Like, bye.